Okay, well, welcome. Good morning or good afternoon, depending which time zone you're in. I'm David Orentlicker, the director of the UNLV Health Law Program, and we're very proud to be uh, hosting our annual Health Law and Policy Conference, along with our partner, the UNLV School of Public Health. Our topic today is medical aid in dying. We do these conferences on an annual basis to address timely and important issues in health law and policy. We're the only law school in Nevada and we're a public law school. And one of the important roles we wanna play and as making sure we serve our community is to be act as a reliable and objective resource for policymakers in Nevada and across the country in, in the area of health law and policy. Um, I wanna thank my colleagues on our team, the planning team, uh, Chris Cochran and Max Gott from the School of Public Health, Debbie Gorov and Sandra Rodriguez from the Boyd School of Law, and also our sponsor for, for today, the Nevada chapter of the American College of Health Executives. So I will, begin today's program with a presentation on the medical and moral and his aspects of aid and dying. And then uh, Max Gock will introduce our other panelists. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is that seen, uh, working okay? Great. Okay, so what, as you see, the, I've titled this The Changing Legal Climate for Medical Aid and Dying. And what I'm gonna talk about, we've seen a trend over the past 25 years or so in the United States from no states allowing aid and dying to now we're up to 10 states in the District of Columbia. And so I'll talk about why I think we're seeing this trend. Uh, some preliminary points. I personally do support a right to medical aid in dying. And last year, I was a co-sponsor of Senate Bill 239, which was a proposal to legalize aid in dying in Nevada. It did pass the legislature and was vetoed by the governor. And I anticipate this uh, proposal coming back in our next session. We are one of the four states that meets every other year. So we're not meeting this year. Uh, so the next opportunity will be in 2025. In my talk today, I will not be advocating, even though I do support a right, I won't be advocating for or against legalization. What I will be doing is discussing why I think we're seeing this trend in favor of legalization. When I read what courts are doing and what they're coming up with is the rules, or I should say states, um, I'll tell you why, why I think we're legalizing it and why we're doing it. When I say we, we as a country, the states that are doing this, why they're doing it and um, and, the, and the forms that the, the legislation's taking. So let me start with some terminology, aid and dying. That is providing a lethal dose of medication to a dying patient. And that's legal in 10 states in the District of Columbia right now. In the United States, um, aid in dying has to take the form of self-administration. Physician provides a prescription that the patient fills and the patient takes the medication. This self-administration approach to aid in dying is also known as physician-assisted suicide. And it's the only method of administration permitted in the United States and also Switzerland. Aid in dying can also take place by with administration by a healthcare provider, also known as euthanasia. And in other countries like Canada, Belgium, Netherlands, allow both self-administration and administration by a healthcare provider. And then the other important term is withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. So patients at the end of life who need a ventilator to breathe or dialysis for their kidneys or feeding tubes to eat, can refuse those treatments or other medical care necessary to sustain their life. And that's legal in every state. 
Okay, so medical aid in dying in the law once uniformly rejected until Oregon in 1994, adopted uh, by public referendum, was the first time to vote uh, for a law for aid in dying. And then it took three years for it to go into effect. Uh, but until then, in the United States, the law did not recognize medical aid in dying. And as I indicated, it's now legalized in 10 states in the District of Columbia, and that picks up about 22% of the population. And it, the legalization has occurred in different ways. In three states, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, it was by public referendum, an initiative that went on the ballot, and the voters of the state approved it. In more states, California, in D.C. and several other states, uh, legislation, the state legislature passed uh, an aid and dying law, and then um, judicial decision. And Montana, the Montana Supreme Court issued a decision saying that there was no bar in the law to aid and dying. Okay, so we have different ways to get to it. But even though there are different routes to legalization and different states, all of the states have taken a common path, and that is limited aid in dying to mentally competent, terminally ill adults. And as I'll talk about, I don't think that's a coincidence. Often we see states vary in their rules, but in this case, we don't. And I think that's very important that we see this convergence on mentally competent, terminally ill adults, especially the terminally ill requirement. Okay, so let me go through some of the rules to be eligible. As I said, in the United States, you must be an adult. You must be terminally ill. And by terminally ill, that's life expectancy less than or equal to six months. You must possess decision-making capacity. You have to decide for yourself and you must be able to self-administer. And this is different from withdrawal of treatment. You don't have to be terminally ill. You don't have to be an adult. You don't have to possess decision-making capacity and your doctor or other healthcare professional can discontinue the treatment for you. So all of these limitations are for aid in dying, not for withdrawal of treatment. In Canada, and, and doc, uh, Dr. Downer will go into more detail about Canada later this, today. You must have a grievous and irremediable condition, which the Canada goes on to further de define, and you can have administration by a physician or nurse. So the terminally ill requirement, while we have it in the United States, you don't see it phrased that way in other countries. It's more like the Canadian grievous and irremediable condition and um, self-administration is not required in uh, Canada or Belgium or the Netherlands. Other safeguards, um, not only do, does your physician or sometimes in some states a nurse or a physician assistant have to determine that you're eligible, but that has to be confirmation of your eligibility by a second health profession. Most states require a physician, but a few states allow a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, New Mexico, for example. Um, if there's some concern about your decision-making capacity, whether you might be depressed or otherwise uh, decision-making ability is altered or com uh, compromised, you must, there must be a referral by one of the two professionals for psychological evaluation. In Hawaii, that psychological evaluation is required for all aid and people who seek aid and dying. Waiting periods, we wanna make, so first when you ask for aid and dying, say you want it, uh, the typical waiting period has been 15 days to reaffirm your desire to make sure this is something you really can continue and it's a stable and enduring desire. Over time, that's been shortened in some states because if you require 15 days for somebody who's terminally ill, they may die um, before they might not have the chance to exercise their right to aid and die. And then uh, states have re usually required residency in the state. 
that's been the standard approach, but that's no longer true in Oregon and Vermont. Lawsuits were filed saying that was violating people's constitutional rights. And before courts had a chance to weigh in, settlements were reached. And now uh, Oregon and Washington, Vermont allow people from out of state to come in. Okay, now, what I my theme, because as I said, when I started, I, what I'm going to talk about is why I think we're seeing this trend. We're up to 10 states, and there's and many other states have considered it. As I said, in Nevada, we actually, and I say we because I'm in the Nevada Assembly, we um, adopt, we pass legislation that was vetoed. So all there's good reason to think we'll see more and more states legalizing it. And, and what I'm going to say is that my, my view is that for the same reasons that the law recognized a broad right to refuse life-sustaining treatment, because anybody, you don't, anybody can refuse life-sustaining treatment. You don't need to be terminally ill. You don't need to be an adult. And um, for the same reasons the law is recognizing a limited right to aid and die. I, I don't think what we're seeing is the kind of change in moral thinking that happens when we've seen with abortion, with Roe changing, saying abortion is morally sufficiently acceptable that we're going to legalize it and then Dobbs going in a different direction. It's a change of view, same-sex marriage, the legalization of same-sex marriage was a change in view about the nature of marriage. I don't think we're seeing people Societal, society really changing its view about the morally accepted death, choice of death, or choice to hasten uh, or shorten the uh, sh shorten the dying process. I don't see, I don't think we're seeing a real change in the way society is thinking about that. And so I'll explain uh, why I think that. So I think there's a couple key factors that are going on that are explaining this trend and end of life decisions. And the first key factor is when you look at what the law is doing when courts are deciding or legislatures are deciding, I think they're trying to carry, to put into effect an important ethical view that when patients are greatly suffering from serious and irreversible illness, when both they're suffering and they have a serious and irreversible illness, they may prioritize quality of life over length of life, right? Some fates are worse than death. And when we get to the, when a patient gets to this point that they've got this irreversible and serious illness like a metastatic cancer uh, and they're greatly suffering, they may decide it's no longer worth continuing living. And, and I think, and my view is this is a commonly shared moral view in society. And as I say, I'm not going to argue whether this is the right moral view, but I am going to say it's widely shared. And I'll give you a couple examples where people, important institutions, explaining why there should be a right to refuse life-sustaining treatment. And here's what they say. Here's, this is the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Massachusetts highest court, when it's recognized a right to refuse life-sustaining treatment, what the court wrote was there is a, a substantial distinction in the state's interest in saving human life where the affliction is curable, as opposed to the state interest where it is here, the issue is not whether, but when, for how long, we've got somebody with a irreversible condition and at what cost to the individual that life may be briefly extended. So the two aspects are here, a serious and irreversible condition and suffering by the patient when they talk about the cost to the individual. And then here's the statement by the Roman Catholic Church. When death is imminent, in spite of the means used, again, serious and irreversible condition, it's permitted to take the decision to refuse treatment that would only secure a precarious and burdensome prolongation of life. So that's the suffering side of it. So when you read why courts and other People talk about why there should be a, why a right to refuse treatment when that was being debated. This is what they talked about. The irreversible condition, serious condition, and suffer, serious and great suffering. Second key factor 
there's a desire for bright line rules rather than general principles for laws at the end of life. And that this is, as I'll talk about, it's not unique to end of life decisions, but I think this is one way where US law and, and with aid and dying differs from other countries. And, and this is an important aspect of it, bright line rules. And I'll explain what I mean by bright line rules. Um, it's not, I said the moral sentiment is serious conditions, great suffering. That's just, that's kind of a general subjective kind of standard. And it's not, read, there's no test for that, no blood test, no MRI scan. It's not readily ascertainable when a patient's illness becomes sufficiently serious. How serious does it have to be? Or when a patient's, um, I'm sorry, when an illness becomes sufficiently serious, how serious does the illness have to be? Do they have, you know, is it, how does it, how far does the cancer have to spread before you say it's a serious enough illness? And how suffering does the patient's um, have, to, how severe does the patient's suffering have to be? Is the pain on a scale of one to 10 have to be nine or 10 or is six or seven sufficient? These are very subjective questions. And allowing the government to decide when a patient's quality of life becomes intolerable would give the state power that can be exercised in arbitrary and, and invidious ways that might be used to disfavoring certain marginalized groups. And, and the, so there's a, a concern about giving government the power to make these judgments about when somebody's condition is serious enough that they ought to be able to end their life because the government would essentially have to say to some people yes you have a terrible condition you can die you can choose to end your life or to other people no you're it's not so bad um you you have to continue living that's a very uh, troublesome kind of authority to give the government so in the end, so to sum it up, end of life laws look for bright line rules that distinguish morally justified actions that shorten life from morally unjustified actions that shorten life. That's what we're trying to ultimately sort out. When is it appropriate to allow somebody to end, shorten their life? When is it inappropriate? And, the, and we've looked for bright line rules. Okay, now I'll talk more about this bright line rule part of it. So I'll start with some history. Uh, at one time, neither aid in dying nor refusal of treatment was allowed. Pre, pre, if you go back to the 60s and early 70s, when this was being debated, there was no right to either. And the law rejected what it said when you read the discussions that was discussed as active and passive euthanasia. Actions to end somebody's life, either actively by injecting them with medicine or passively by discontinuing their treatment. But they were both viewed as forms of euthanasia. And then in 1976, the New Jersey Supreme Court in the Quinlan case recognized a right to refuse treatment. And at that time, the court said, but only for patients with, with what the court described as a dim prognosis. And these were patients who were suffering greatly from a serious and irreversible disease, which is the, what I talked about earlier. That that's what I gave you the Massachusetts Supreme Court, but the New Jersey Supreme Court said the same thing. They were worried about patients who were, had a serious and irreversible disease and they were suffering greatly from it. And the court said for those patients, there should be a right to refuse treatment. They didn't say any patient at the time, they said, it was dependent on the condition. And for patients who had a curable condition, there wasn't a right in the view of the New Jersey Supreme Court. So these are patients for whom the life ending act of treatment withdrawal was viewed as morally justified. And that's what the court said. Only those patients could have a right to refuse treatment. But as mentioned, it's problematic for the state to decide who must live and who may die based on judgments about patients' quality of life. Judgments might be influenced by biases based on ethnicity, race, sex, age, disability, or economic status. And we've seen plenty of examples in our country of people being disfavored in the law based on their race, ethnicity, sex, age, disability, or economic status. And so courts are 
were sensitive to that. And so subsequent to Quinlan, while the court started with this sliding scale, kind of like an abortion, right? The, in Roe, as the fetus developed more and more, the right to abortion became weaker. Same thing as pa the patient's condition was better, their right to refuse treatment weakened. Uh, the court subsequent to Quinlan, including the New Jersey Supreme Court in later cases, abandoned the sliding scale. Let, left it up to, pay, to the patient to consider a quality of life. We're not going to have the state decide whether your quality of life is so bad that you can refuse treatment. It's for the patient to decide. And so the right to refuse treatment now belongs to all, all patients, regardless of their condition, regardless of their level of suffering. We don't ask that question. As long as they're meant, as long as we're confident it's what their choice is or what their surrogates choices for them, the treatment can be discontinued. But I think we still get only morally, morally justified actions. Why, why are we willing to open it all up if we have this desire to limit it to morally justified situations? Because for the most part, life-sustaining treatment is refused when patients are suffering from serious and irreversible illness. Those are the People who are refusing ventilators or feeding tubes or dialysis have a serious and irreversible illness and they're suffering. They're experiencing great suffering. If we don't have to worry that people who have a simple condition are refusing antibiotics. When they do, sometimes that does happen. It's not never. But when you see those kinds of refusals, they typically reflect religious beliefs blood transfusions, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian scientists, and other medical treatments. And, and we have a First Amendment of freedom, right to a religion. So that we're willing to tolerate those refusals because they're religiously based. And in fact, those refusals aren't always respected. It's not hard to find cases where a hospital would go to court and, and to get a court order for a blood transfusion for somebody with a Jehovah's Witness because they had a very easily curable condition and they weren't suffering greatly from, they didn't fit into our category of a morally justified death and courts would order the treatment. Uh, the trial courts anyway, later the Court of Appeals would, would say, you shouldn't have done that, but you can't undo a blood transfusion. So in other words, the distinction between treatment withdrawal and aid in dying, I don't think is reflected an important moral difference between the two acts, and I'll talk more about what, that. Still, there has been an important moral reason for the legal distinction between the two practices. And the, the distinction, you can anybody can withdraw treatment, nobody until the 90s could have aid in dying, was a a proxy, legal proxy to sort the morally justified death from the morally unjustified death. And proxies then are common in the law. So I'll give you some examples to flesh out this concept, right? When we think about speed limits, our goal is our moral principle at stake is we want people to drive at a safe speed. And that could be the law. You can drive at any speed that's as long as it's safe. And in fact, Montana tried that. In Iowa, too, didn't work very well, but they actually tried it. So what we say is you may drive at speeds up to 65 miles an hour or 55, whatever the speed limit, is, but not at faster speeds. It's not a perfect, it doesn't correlate perfectly with safe speed, but it wouldn't work to have this general principle drive at a safe speed because then you get arbitrary enforcement by police officers, so we just set a bright line rule that your speedometer can easily ascertain for you whether you're following the speed limit or not. Or think voting. The, we want people to vote when they're mature enough or informed enough or whatever the principle at stake we're trying to get at. So, But we don't say you can vote when you are mature enough because that would be problematic when the registrar of voters, who often is a partisan position, gets to decide whether you get to vote or not, or think back to the South, once the right to vote was uh, recognized for black 
Americans, they would use literacy tests to screen out black voters. So we don't want to give voting reg voter uh, registrars that kind of authority. And so we just say, you get to start voting at age 18, but not before them. There are 17 years old who would be capable voters. And there may be people who are well past the age of 18 who wouldn't be capable voters, but we don't want to get into whether you are a a good and appropriate voter. And we just say, when you get to 18. And so that kind of concept here is instead of saying you can choose life ending action when you are suffering greatly from serious and irreversible and untreatable illness, we said you can refuse life, unwanted life sustaining treatment, but not undertake assisted suicide. Because that we thought that was a good way to sort the people who had a moral, a, a, pro, a good reason, morally justified reason for choosing death from those who didn't have one. So allowing the right to refuse treatment with, without getting into with, you know, how serious is your illness and how severe you're suffering, just anybody can do it. The easily applicable rule didn't go too far in allowing death causing actions. We didn't think there were people who shouldn't be refusing treatment who are getting in under this bright line, easily applicable law. But there was a lot of concern that it didn't go far enough because there are some people suffering from serious and irreversible illness who aren't dependent on life-sustaining treatment. And if we think people who have a serious and ir irreversible illness and are suffering greatly shouldn't have to have a prolonged dying process, what about them? How do they? How do we allow them to choose a, you know, to shorten the life, uh, the dying process? And if we allow aiding dying for the terminally ill for patients who are terminally ill, it revises the legal rules so they serve as better proxies to distinguish between morally justified and morally unjustified deaths. We don't say aiding dying for everybody because we can think of a lot of people who might choose to end their life with the lethal prescription who aren't suffering from a serious illness. But by definition, people with terminal illness are suffering from a serious and irreversible illness. And we assume that it's common enough that they will be suffering greatly from it. So it's a, again, in a pretty, it's not a, obviously terminal illness isn't a perfect test rule in the way a speed limit is not as readily ascertainable, but it's a much more objective kind of a guideline than do you have a serious condition. Terminal illness, you've got six months to live. It's a much more objective marker. So, so we're still limiting death hastening action to patients suffering from serious and irreversible illness because they have to have a terminal illness still with a relative a bright line rule. So that's that's my take on what I think is going on. Again, I'm not, it may be the right thing too. It might be normatively the right thing. But my point is that this is what I, how I explain what I think is going on, more of a descriptive argument. What about the usual moral arguments? Why, why don't I think those are explaining it? I don't think that this distinction we had between 1976 and the mid nineties, where we had this period where you could have withdrawal of treatment, but you couldn't have aid and die. And remember it's a limited period because before 1976, you couldn't have either. And since Oregon and other states now, you can have both in, many, in, in a number of states. So it was only a brief period where you had this distinction between withdrawal treatment aid and dying. Uh, I don't think, as I said, I don't think it's reflected an important moral difference between the two acts standing alone, though I acknowledge that other people see an important difference. And so I'll talk about um, that. And the reason why I say this is the common arguments apply to both aid in dying and withdrawal of treatment, which is why the law prohibited both practices before the Quinlan case, right? Until 1976, you couldn't have either. 
and why Justice Antonin Scalia, when the U.S. Supreme Court took up, should there be a constitutional right to aid and dine? That was in 1997. I'm sorry, this, this was about when the court took up in the Cruzan case, when Justice uh, Antonin Scalia wrote his concurring opinion in the Cruzan case, when the court did recognize a right to refuse life-sustaining treatment, Justice Scalia thought there should be a, there shouldn't be a constitutional right to refuse life-sustaining treatment or aid in dying. He said, "Look, when you look at the moral arguments, they don't distinguish between the two. They're problematic for the same reason, and there shouldn't be a right to either." So, I think I think both that's he he had a good point, and I think the two as he observed, there's a good reason to think that the two acts should rise or fall together when you look at the usual moral argument. So let's go through some of them. One of the most important is a, is a matter of causation. What you'll read courts often say is withdrawal, uh, aid in dying is a killing, withdrawal of a treatment is letting people die or acts versus omissions writing a prescription, injecting a patient with a lethal dose of medication is an act, withdrawing treatment is an omission. And killings and acts are worse than letting die, letting, letting somebody die or omitting. But I think uh, that cor confuses correlations with justifications. Yes, it is true that killings are usually worse than letting lettings die, but not always. Some killings are permissible for example, self-defense. And some lettings die are not permissible, not feeding one's baby. Uh, and in, also acts are typically more blameworthy than omissions. If you don't, if you cause, if you push somebody into, uh, you know, depth of water where they drown, that's more blameworthy than not jumping in to rescue them when they're floundering in the water. But it's not always true that acts are more blameworthy than omissions. So withholding versus withdrawing, which we use, there used to be thought that it was worse to withdraw than withhold, but withholding actually is worse, not giving the treatment, that's an omission, as opposed to withdrawing does take an act, because with withholding, you don't even give it the patient chance to see if the patient will do well with the treatment withdrawing. You, you've tried it out to see if it will work, it hasn't provided the benefit you hope for, and now you discontinue it. So these distinctions, as I say, are true often, but not always. And withdrawing treatment is an act and can be a killing. So if I turned off ventilators in an intensive care unit, I would be charged with murder, and I could not say I just let them die. It wouldn't be a, a, a very effective defense. And in D, turning off a ventilator more directly causes a patient's death than writing a prescription for a lethal dose of drugs. In Oregon, now more than 25 years of experience, about 35% of patients never take the drugs. But as I said, if you turn off ventilators in Oregon for patients who are dependent on a ventilator, it'll be a very small number, certainly below 1% that will survive that. Another argument that you'll see is the distinction between a natural and an unnatural death. And is with act versus omission, killing versus letting die, it's a correlation rather than a justification. Because often the unnatural is better than the natural. Right, the natural death is you die from your condition, unnatural is with a, taking a lethal dose of medication. It's better to have an unnatural appendectomy than a natural ruptured appendix. And almost all medicine is unnatural. Surgery is not a natural course of life to have your body cut open by a doctor. Um, there's also, this is more of a getting into a, a legal kinds of arguments, negative versus positive rights. Negative rights, we have rights to be left alone. We don't have rights to demand things. Um, and treatment withdrawal, the argument goes, is a negative right not to have treatment imposed on you. Suicide assistance entails a positive right to get 
medication to end your life, but actually both are negative rights. The right to aid in dying is a negative right for patients and their doctors to act without government assistance. You still need a willing doctor, as all the states recognize, can't force your doctor to write a prescription. They have to agree to, and it's just a negative right for the government to leave you alone. And this is like when a right to abortion is also a negative right in the states that have it still to act without government interference. Your right to abortion doesn't give you a right to find to insist that your obstetrician perform it. It doesn't give you a right that the government will pay for it. It's just a right that if you can find a doctor to provide it for you, the government can't interfere. A very important concern is the risk to vulnerable patients. The patients may choose aid in dying while depressed out of a perceived duty to die because of inadequate palliative care. And those are all important concerns and we should be worried about them. But they're just as much a concern for withdrawal of treatment. Patients may refuse a ventilator because they're depressed or a perceived duty to die because they haven't had adequate palliative care. And indeed, the risk may be greater when we have a right to refuse treatment because patients, we allow the right, we allow refuse, re, uh, withdrawal of treatment for patients who aren't competent. So if we're gonna, if we're concerned about vulnerable patients having treatment and have their lives ending prematurely and somebody else is deciding, it's a greater risk. And interestingly, and the concerns about inadequate palliative care, Oregon's been a leader in the provision of palliative care. And, and then a, a, another important argument is financial pressures. When physicians and hospitals face increasing pressure to contain costs, they may too readily support or encourage the choice of aid in dying. And again, I'm not gonna, I don't deny that that's a, a possibility. We have to be concerned about it, but it's also a huge concern with withdrawal of treatment because aiding dying saves far less money than withdrawing ventilators, dialysis, and feeding tubes from patients who could live for many years with treatment. Remember, aiding dying, you have to have a life expectancy of no more than six months. And you and presumably you're not dependent on a ventilator or dialysis because you could just stop it. There's far more money to be saved on patients who, as I say, who uh, are dependent on ventilators. And back in when the debate over whether Nancy Cruzan's parents could um, approve the withdrawal of her ventilator or of her feeding tube, it was a feeding tube, the, one of the things people talked about was why they should be able to, well, we're spending, you know, I think it was over $100,000 a year to keep her alive. And there's better ways to use 100,000 in our healthcare system when kids aren't being vaccinated. And, and so, yes, we should be worried about financial pressures, but it's that doesn't help us distinguish between aid and dying and withdrawal treatment. Okay, so as I say, in sum, I, I, my goal in, in this was to just explain why I think we're seeing this trend of legalization. And as I said, I don't think it's because we've changed our view about which, when people ought to be able to choose a, to shorten the dying process. It's just how we make sure we have clear bright line rules that sort the morally justified from the morally unjustified death and allowing aid in dying just for terminally ill patients gives us that bright line rule. So I think that terminal illness requirement is, is a very important one. And I, I think it's not surprising we've seen it in every state. And I think while we're seeing relaxation of some of the safeguards like the waiting periods and um, whether you need to be a resident, I, I think the terminal illness requirement will be much more durable. And if that's gonna change, I'm not gonna, I don't think it can never change because, but if it's gonna change, we need another bright line rule. We may, maybe we'll say eight months or nine months, something uh, that we feel comfortable, assuming we can feel comfortable and you know making those kinds of predictions. But we'll, I think we'll always have an effort to find a bright line rule. We're, we're not going to go to aid and dying for anybody, and and I think we're going to less likely to follow the lead of other countries that have used a more subjective standard like a grievous and irremediable condition.
So uh, I think we have some time for questions. So Max. Yeah, thank whatever. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Orntlicker, for a great presentation and for framing this issue for us. Um, one of the questions that has come in has to do with sort of um, how to balance other legal duties. And specifically, if you could address the implications of this for patients in custody of the state, for example, prisoners or psychiatric patients. Uh, in other words, the question says if they have a right to death, doesn't this conflict with the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Patients Act, which creates an affirmative duty for a facility to prevent suicide? Okay, yeah, so um, this kind of a question was a big issue with withdrawal of treatment in nursing homes because you know they had legal obligations to keep their patients alive and they were worried, well, if we discontinue feeding tubes, how is that gonna play in? Um, on the issue of suicide, one of the important things about all the law states that have legalized aid in dying is they're very clear, this does not authorize suicide. And it's very important to recognize that aid in dying is, is not, even though it's been called physician assisted suicide, it's, it's not what we mean by suicide. What we mean by suicide is the choice by somebody who maybe has compromised decision-making capacity or is, you know, not, doesn't have good reasons for choosing a, a life, uh, life shortening, um, you know, action. Uh, so this isn't suicide. And, and, th and that's another important thing going to uh, ties into, remember I said, we used to say active and passive euthanasia, pa withdrawal treatment, we, we described as passive euthanasia, which is, a pejorative term to say it's not something that should be accepted morally and and often what we what happens in this area is we have to first decide is this a, an action we think is morally justified or not and if we think it's morally justified we give it a positive term like withdrawal of treatment death with dignity and if we don't think it's acceptable we give it a, a, a more pejorative term like euthanasia or suicide so um, the decision to refuse treatment when you're terminally ill uh, is not a suicide in the way we've had these, you know, people who have uh, psychiatric illness and are, are, are ending their life. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Thanks so much. Another question that's come in um, really focuses on uh, the terminal illness requirement. And the suggestion is that it might not be so bright. Um, it's already adjusted. For example, if a patient declines chemotherapy, and one of the things that came up in our conversation yesterday uh, when we focused on Nevada was thinking about to what extent physicians actually know that someone's going to live six months versus some other type of period. Could you address that a little bit? Yeah, no, that is true. It's not as, uh, as, as, as precise as your age 18 or your speed, your speed limit is 65. Um, and it depends too on the illness, right? For solid tumor cancers like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, um, that have become the metastatic, um, lung cancers, uh, doctors' estimates of life expectancy are much more accurate than with congestive heart failure or Alzheimer's disease. So it can depend on the illness, how, how reliable it is. Uh, I know there were studies, one of the studies from some time ago that looked at patients who qualified for hospice benefits under Medicare, which to qualify for hospice benefits, you needed to, uh, the doctor just to, to certify that your life expectancy was six months or less, same um, same standard for terminal illness. And I think the study showed that 85% that, that of the patients who were certified for hospice benefits did die within six months. So it's, 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 not, it's not perfect, um, but the important thing is we're not, uh, even if there are imprecisions there, they're not imprecisions about doctors deciding who gets to live and who gets to die. They're using this standard of terminal illness. They're not, not doctors imposing their view. It's just about whether 
they think this person meets the standard of a terminal illness. So I, 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 I don't, I, the imprecision may cause some problems, but it doesn't undermine this concern about the government deciding who gets to live and who gets to die based on quality of life judgments. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come in uh, has to do with the ability for states like Vermont and Oregon to handle the possible demand of people requesting aid and dying from um, other states and whether there are designated clinics or assistance or, or yeah. how, how that tends to be handled. Good question. And fortunately, two of our speakers, one's from Oregon and one's for, from Vermont. And I, I know that they thought about this and, and for their presentation. So I will uh, encourage them to comment or uh, we can do it during the panel dis discussion, but um, that's something we can address today for sure. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's also another question in here that um, asks whether uh, Schloendorf protected the right to refuse um, uh, treatment long before Cruzan, and if you could comment on that a little bit. Oh yeah, that, that's true. I mean, there were court cases long before 1976 that talked about a right to a foreign consent that you can't be operated on without your consent. So there was this general right, um, although even the principle of informed consent didn't start getting developed seriously by the courts till much later. But uh, even if you had this right, under Schloendorf and other cases to, to refuse to consent to a surgical procedure, the question was, did the state's interest in prolonging life override your right to refuse treatment? So that was the important question in Quinlan. No rights are absolute, and did your right to refuse treatment, um, did it have to yield to the state's greater interest in preserving life? Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, answering these questions. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, hear from our next speaker. And one of the questions was a, a great segue. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Diana Barnard, who's an associate professor of family medicine and the lead palliative care physician at the University of Vermont Health Network. We're going to hear from her now. So thank you, 